You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are watching, listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Well, why is the next five years going to be different than the last five years on Wall Street? I mean, a, a really, uh, unless you uh, just bought some loser stocks and just held on to them, um, it was so easy to make money in the past five years. Uh, my next guest, Simon Ree. You are author of the best-selling book, The Tao of Trading, uh, thinks that the next five years, well, I'll let you explain why you think the next five years is going to be different. I have my view. Uh, Simon, it's great to have you on the show. So next five years, that's actually from 2022, from now to 2027. That mm -hmm. is a long, uh, a long ways out there, right? I, I guess it is. Yeah. Yes. So um, what's going to happen in the next five years that will set it apart from the previous five years? And why should you care? Well, when you look at the previous five years or the, the previous 15 years, stocks, asset prices have had a massive tailwind of a, of, a, of a growing Fed balance sheet. So the Fed balance sheet has expanded to nine trillion dollars. And that sort of exponential balance sheet expansion doesn't happen in a vacuum, okay? Its effects are felt in other markets. And we've seen the effects in the stock market, the property market, the bond market, crypto. What's happened now is that not only has the balance sheet expansion stopped, it's gone into reverse. It has uh, embarked on quantitative tightening. And instead of embarking on a policy of zero interest rates, they're hiking interest rates uh, at the most aggressive rate at any time since 1994. And of course, we've got inflation now for the first time really since the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, we haven't had to deal with inflation for four decades. And uh, I think a lot of people have forgotten just how pernicious inflation can be. So the next five years, I think one of two scenarios is likely. Either the Fed stick to their guns, they keep their foot on the gas pedal of uh, tightening policy through quantitative tightening and hiking rates. Uh, and if they do that, that will have obviously a fairly dramatic effect on economic growth and, and asset prices. It would probably send us into a pretty, pretty steep recession. But that's their only hope, I believe, of getting inflation under control. The other alternative is that the Fed blink. And as soon as economic activity really does start to roll off and, and the S&P drops another 10 or 15%, they stop hiking and, and even perhaps give the market what it's looking for, a, a dovish pivot and start uh, cutting rates or maybe doing some more QE. Uh, and that would sort of be a repeat of the 1970s experience where it was a very stop start approach where we saw three major peaks in inflation. Uh, we had four recessions in the space of about 12 years and a decade plus of economic volatility. Right. So they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. I think they're out of good choices, yeah. All right. So they're out of choices. Um, they don't really know what the heck they're going to do. And so so what is the, uh, how, as an investor, how do you play this? How do you make money or how do you just keep your money? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think a lot of people approach this question of, of, from a fixed mindset of where should I put my money? This is probably the most common question I get at the moment, Simon, where should I put my money? Because when you look at the year-to-date scorecard for 2022, stocks are down, bonds are down, gold, everyone's in favor, favorite inflation hedge is down, crypto is down, and of course, cash isn't down in nominal terms, but in real terms, holding cash isn't that interesting when inflation's <laughs> raging at 9%. So what what is the haven trade, right? <laughs> um, so my my encouragement to people is don't approach this with the fixed mindset of you know, where do I put my money? Uh, approach it with a growth mindset of uh, how and when do I expose my money to risk? Uh, I'm a big proponent of people, instead of being exposed to risk all of the time, they learn how to identify 
those high probability moments in time to expose their capital to risk. All right. So, uh, so short of leaving the world uh, prematurely, uh, you got limited alternatives. Uh, your thing, precious metals, all right, they've underperformed. They've been in a, you know, certainly the past two months have been uh, in a uh, distinctly depressed state. Uh, are they the future if there's inflation? Um, you know, you mentioned inflation. I got a couple of years on you. I actually remember the 70s. And, you know, uh, I see a lot of parallels, but I see a lot of differences too. So whether gold ends up being the haven trade, I, look, I, I don't have a strong view on that. I mean, it, I, I think it could, but I don't see any compelling reason why it will. Um, my, my, my preferred method is to employ technical analysis to highlight the best assets to own either long or short on, on a fairly short time frame. Uh, I'm a big proponent of regular compounding. You know, one of the uh, one of the big myths of Wall Street is that 10% per annum is a great return. And that's really derived from the, the long term annual returns of the S&P 500. And look, 10% per annum is it, it's a it's a fine return if, if you're already wealthy, and, and you're just looking to stay wealthy or or generate an income off an already significant asset base. But if you're looking to grow your account quickly or, or generate income off a smaller asset base, uh, I, I think you need to be able to compound your returns regularly. And, and I advocate monthly compounding, uh, and that's achieved through shorter term trading. Okay. What about uh, real estate as an asset class? Now, obviously it's been impacted uh, residential, I'm talking about commercial. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. Maybe they'll turn the nation's uh, commercial high rises into dog runs because uh, the pet industry is booming. As people get more depressed, they need more pets, it seems. And right. they, they will they will uh, spare no expense for Rover and for uh, the cat, uh, whatever they have to do. But short of that, so residential real estate were in a situation where obviously rates are going to affect it. However, we're also in a situation where there is a distinct shortage of especially affordable residential housing, rental housing. So the rental market is going to stay strong and that should put a, uh, I guess, a net or a, uh, a limit on how low residential real, real estate can go down, uh, do you think? I don't think the real estate market is going to be a repeat of 2008. I don't think we're going to see a big, big residential real estate crash, but I think there's certainly scope for prices to come down, certainly, you know, what, 10, 15, 20% from where they are, because you're right, uh, interest rates have risen, mortgage rates have had the, the greatest percentage increase ever, uh, and, and property at the moment's in that awkward spot where Borrowing costs have soared, but property prices still haven't quite come down. And so what we're seeing now is, is a, a surge in inventory of new homes. And we're also starting to see prices getting cut at, at a very drastic rate as well. And if the Fed maintain their, their tightening, well, their, you know, their hawkish bias, I, I think it's only a matter of time before that really starts to filter into unemployment. We've already seen hiring freezes across big tech or across the tech sector generally. We're starting to see layoffs. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time before the unemployment rate starts ticking up and, you know, people, you know, when that happens, people stop making payments on their mortgages and, and properties get sold uh, and, and all of that will be fairly negative, I think, in short term for the property market. Not disastrous like in 08, but there's, yeah. there's, you know, the cracks are starting to appear. All right. Uh, I think that's reasonable. I think that uh, people, there's still going to be a demand there. And uh, perhaps uh, we've hit uh, the peak of rents. So obviously, uh, real estate trades at some kind of multiple or something based on its future cash flow, right? So mm -hmm. future cash flow is constrained, then the price increase is constrained. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I think that's a fair assumption. And also the discount rate applied to that cash flow is increased. Yes. And, and, and like, like, likely to increase further. So higher cap rates higher uh, discount rates. So people are going to, because inflation going up, people looking for higher returns, but when there is no place where you can get higher returns, um, 
What effect does that have on the discount rate? Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Fury Gold Mines is a Canada-focused exploration and development company committed to aggressively growing its scalable high-grade gold assets with major drill campaigns planned across its 3.5 million ounce portfolio. Fury is led by a management team of proven explorers and developers with a track record of success in advancing and financing project development. Fury Gold Mines is well positioned to create value for investors with low risk development growth and the potential for a new major discovery. Fury Gold Mines trades on the TSX and NYSE American under the ticker F-U-R-Y. To learn more, go to furygoldmines.com. That's furygoldmines.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Well, the discount rate's sort of a function of your, of your borrowing cost, really. And I think if the Fed are serious about stamping out inflation, um, the Fed funds rate is, is likely to have to move well beyond neutral. You know, the... the, the Powell made the comment that they, they felt that rates currently were, were about neutral. Um, but really, all, all that means is that uh, they're no longer pouring petrol on the bonfire. Uh, the, the bonfire is still raging and all, all they've done is stop pouring petrol on it. Uh, they haven't yet got the fire extinguisher out. And in order to do that, rates would have to go well, well north of neutral. Hey, I, I love the uh, colloquialisms. As they say, uh, we're... We're two people uh, divided by a common language, but basically <laughs> you're saying don't pour gasoline on the fire. Uh, and that's what they're, they're going to have to do to get this thing under control because there is kind of is no other way. You either just say, accept double digit inflation and allow uh, money creation to just and credit creation just to continue unabated or, uh, keep raising rates and watch the uh, economic fallout from that. That's really what it comes down to. So tell us about your book, because I'm looking for the Tao here in uh, these investment scenarios, Simon, and I don't see it. Sure. So my book is, it's really an instruction manual on how to, how to approach trading options. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of options trading because they are the finance industry's greatest risk management tool, and they offer leverage, which means you can generate small returns off a small capital outlay. And it really takes the reader through you know, the, the, the mental approach, trading psychology, adopting the right mindset, right the way through to what an option is, we talk about some of the big myths of Wall Street. Uh, I give, give away one of my favorite trend-following trading setups, uh, we talk a lot about risk management. So it really is that, you know, the tower means the way. And and, and my, my objective with the book was to give people every, every step of the way that they need to become a successful independent trader. Um, you might wonder why write a book on options trading when there are already hundreds, if not thousands of books on options trading out there. Uh, yeah, um, you just stole my next question, but why don't you <laughs> tell us, tell us the answer, Simon. Okay, well, the reason I wrote the book was... Um, I, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of options trading books out there, and, and I've read a good number of them. But the problem is they, they all tend to be quite dull and boring and, and quite difficult and complex. And my mission with this book was to write a book that was both engaging and, and simple, easy to understand. And I've had many, many readers tell me they finished the book within a weekend and uh, it was fun and engaging and, and easy to get through. So I, I think I've succeeded. All right. And so... If the market's going to do squat for the next five years, am I better off just do it simple, write covered calls on uh, tech stocks that aren't going to go up? Well, it depends how far the tech stocks fall. I mean, you, you know, you look at some of the declines we've seen already uh, in, in a range of tech stocks, whether it's Peloton or Datadog or Shopify. Um, writing covered calls is giving you a, a very, very small uh, measure of downside protection. Uh, I, I think writing covered calls could work on, on a diversified portfolio of blue chip stocks. But again, it depends on your returns objectives. If, if you want to generate a return of 10% a year, that sort of strategy can work really, really well. If you're chasing returns more like 5% per month, you, you probably need to be a little bit more active and a little bit more directional. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, when you think of options, you think of risk. 
And you think of the fact that 95% of the people that buy options lose money. Um, now, obviously, that number is not exactly accurate because uh, it doesn't account for hedging, where you buy those options and your goal isn't necessarily to make money at it, but to protect your downside. So I think that that number is skewed. But the vast majority of people lose money in options. That's true. And the reality is nobody makes you get a license to open an options brokerage account. All right. But when if you open an options brokerage account without first learning how to trade options, it's a bit like throwing the keys of a paddle shift Ferrari to a 16-year-old and saying, here, take this for a spin. Now, that 16-year-old might get around the block, might make it through a few sets of traffic lights and have really good fun in the short term. But I think we can agree it's, it's likely to end in an accident. And sadly, that's how most people fare when they're trading options. You know, they, they open the account brokerage and they see options chains and numbers and lights flashing. And if you don't really know what you're doing, it can be very overwhelming and very confusing and, and easy to make a mistake. So I think getting a proper education is, is essential. Okay. And, uh, you know, sometimes you got to pay for that education, though. And you're going to lose money when you start out because you're going to make mistakes. It just happens, right? Yeah, so absolutely. So the key is to not make too many to make the lessons that you're going to learn not too costly. And look, you've been trading them for a long time. For you, it's second nature. And and uh, I assume it's probably all you do. But what about for the average person, uh, Joe Sixpack, Steve Chardonnay, who you know has a life too and uh, has a job or a business, can't really sit at the screen, uh, watch moment to moment uh, fluctuations and gyrations and, absolutely and they happen uh, can that can that those people can you actually uh, make them money absolutely uh, i've had wonderful feedback from hundreds of my members from from all over the world but the way we approach options trading is we, we we look at daily charts so all of the decisions are made when the market's closed outside of the you know the flashing lights and the moving numbers and what I've done is I've, I've built a number of scans. So we scan for some very specific technical criteria. Those scans can be run in a matter of seconds, and they give you a short list of high potential trading candidates for that day. And so instead of wading through hundreds of charts every day and having to watch them all day every day, when the market's closed, run the scan, you might have two or three charts to look at. You, you might have 20, you might have none. It, it just depends on market conditions on that day. But I say to people, once, once you've grooved the practice and you're familiar with, with the routine and the techniques, you should be able to get your trading done on average in about 20 minutes a day. Well, some yeah. days it'll take five minutes, some days it might take an hour, but, but, but on average about 20 minutes. All right. So all you got to do is cut down on your uh, Facebook addiction by 20 uh, minutes per day. And I'm saying Facebook because I know a lot of you out there are uh, my age and you actually look at it. I try to avoid it because it's just such a, a super time waster. But anybody can find 20 minutes in their day to do this. Well, I find this uh, really interesting. Simon, uh, how do we connect with you on the web? Uh, how do we buy your book? I assume it's available wherever fine books used to be sold. Well, yeah, it's, it's certainly available on Amazon. Um, it's uh, if you get my website is uh, Tao of Trading, which is T A O O F T R A D I N G dot com uh, forward slash book. That has got the um, seeing if I've got a copy of it here. So here's a here is here's the book. Got it. Um, yeah. And uh, it's yeah, it's available on on Amazon. And look, I've got um, I have got some resources available for your audience as well. If if you hit if they hit to www.towoftrading.com forward slash FSN. Um, that stands for Financial Survival Network. Uh, there's some resources there. They can download the first chapter of my book for free and they can get a 38% discount on one of my leading programs as well. Excellent. Excellent. We always like to see that. There will be a link in the show notes to this interview on Financial Survival Network. And I'm looking at that lovely page right now. Can't beat that. And uh, hey, just go, go over there. And while you're there, sign up for a free newsletter. We really appreciate you coming on, Simon. I want to have you on again, for sure. Uh, looking at the market right now, just give us a couple of 
bits of advice. So when I come back here with you in six weeks, we can kind of review what you suggested and see how it worked out. I would say um, in a bear market, which, which is what we're in at the moment, um, you can't ignore the counter trend moves. All right. So we're in a bull market. We're in a bear market rally at the moment. Uh, I would say this rally has potentially got further to go, but but don't fall in love with it. All right. The, we're in a cyclical upswing, but we're in a structural downtrend. Um, so my best advice would be don't fall in love with the rally. Don't chase it. Don't get tempted to think that the, the worst is all over. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in six months, sorry, six weeks time, um, the market has, has started to head back south again. All right. So don't fall in love with bear market rallies. I think that's really sound advice. Um, going back to the Dow theory, there's three, three uh, cycles in effect at any given time. One is the uh, primary cycle, which right now is bear. Uh, the next is the intermediate cycle, which right now is, of course, uh, rallying. Uh, positive. And then you have your daily cycle, which is a bunch of noise that you only really kind of interpret as it happens. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is uh, the Dow theory written, I think, close to 100 years ago, uh, said that what often happens is that the intermediate cycle gets mistaken for the primary cycle because it yeah. moves so quickly and violently. And I think today it does that more than ever. So I think that's really sage advice there. Appreciate you coming on. If you've got a question for Simon, shoot me an email. Uh, and also tell me about your trading experience, what you've been encountering. Have you been making money, losing money, treading water? Love to hear about it. And again, the email address kl at kerrylutz.com. Simon, been a complete pleasure. Thank you so much for coming by. Been a real pleasure, Kerry. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.